going on everybody i don't know where Britt went but we're back here with our pff roto grinder show of the week mismatch manifesto on the way player props best bets some cash and gpp picks along the way great day be great some might say Britt, welcome yeah i'm back uh click the wrong button right before the show never want to close out the stream yard window but uh welcome to you back nice uh nice little studio you got going there by the way nice nice jerseys moving on up ian I got uh, I got the sign Michael Irvin over one shoulder, classic powder blue LT over another, even a little bit of a Raiders Charles Woodson throwback. It's it's a great day to be great, Britt. Yeah, this is gonna be a fun show. Week two is it? I don't know. Do we overreact or do we adjust properly to week one? There, you know, <laughs> the, the one of the notes I know I have from week one is that these teams that spent on these wide receivers, they used them, uh, and I think that should be something we see going forward. You know, you trade all these assets for these wide receivers, and then you have to pay them an enormous amount of money, you better use them. And we saw that from the Raiders. We saw that from the Dolphins with Tyreek Hill. We saw A.J. Brown go nuclear. Now, some of these guys aren't on the slate. It's sort of a wacky week, too. But that was one of my big takeaways from from week one. 100%. 100%. But what you mentioned about just kind of the wacky week two, having the multiple Monday night games, and then obviously Sunday night, Thursday night, lost a lot of good receivers uh, out there. So still plenty of options, but just going through, I mean, the overall slate, I'm not so sure there's going to be one like super chalky uh, receiver out there. Maybe an injury or two could throw things off, but fairly even ownership uh, across the board could get interesting. If anything, I've been seeing some murmurs that like Allen Robinson could be the chalky receiver. Oh, I hope so. <laughs> yeah, I about to say, I don't want to play him in the first place. <laughs> So that sounds good to me. We'll see. You never, you never really know. I think that Stafford elbow thing is uh, that looks to be like an actual concern at this point in time, if you ask me. But anyway, I think the AJ Terrell shadow coverage isn't going to help matters this week, too. Yeah, let's jump into your article over at PFF. Now, last year it was free. This year it is behind the paywall. So this is one of the only ways outside of a PFF subscription that you are able to get a look of it and some of Ian's thoughts about it. Of course, you can also listen to Ian on the PFF pod. Uh, but let's jump into this for DFS and sports betting purposes. Uh, explosive play rate. These are ways to rack up big yards, lots of fantasy points in a singular play. What are some teams that could possibly maybe be a little sneaky uh, and even players that we can maybe look at from the prop betting perspective uh, in week two? Yeah, I got two main takeaways uh, from this one. The Panthers popping as a candidate to really dog walk this Giants secondary. And when you start looking at some of the injuries going on there in the New York Giants cornerback room, already a group that, you know, we aren't exactly terrified of. They lost James Bradbury in the offseason. So still got a Dory Jackson there. But I just think this could be another example of uh, one of Robbie Anderson or DJ Moore going off. I mean, maybe this is one of those, uh, what I think it was like Will Fuller a couple years ago, man. Everyone just kept waiting for kind of the dud to happen. And then, he kept putting up big numbers. I and um, we had Deshaun Jackson a couple years ago where he had the huge week one. And it was just like, all right, let's fade him in week two. I mean, Robbie Anderson is still going to be, you know, the, the definitive number two in Carolina throughout the entire season. So if he gets behind the secondary, only really takes one play with him. Also, would just note that, man, really good potential for a CMC bounce back spot and still not being priced, you know, nearly what we've kind of seen uh, at his prime, especially on DraftKings. So we saw Don Show Hilliard absolutely massacre these linebackers last week. That's problematic before they go ahead and go up against CMC. Raiders offense also as a whole, just looking really good. Arizona defense. I think we talked talked about it last week like losing Chandler Jones okay you got Buda Baker back there but really just in that front seven not JJ Watt I don't think he's quite you know prime in prime form anymore so don't really have the same weapons that we're used to seeing out there in Arizona and with Devontae Adams just looking man unstoppable and yeah AJB and you know these other Tyreek had a had a great game in his own right as well but Adams man this guy is this guy going to average 12 catches per season I mean per year my goodness, per week, I could see it happening, Britt. So Devontae Adams, someone that I am trying to get into cash game lineups. But with that said, Josh Jacobs actually in a pretty good spot too. I mean, now that we had last night's fun game between the Chiefs and Chargers off the board, Raiders Cardinals is now going to be the highest implied game of the week. So Brandon Bolden not practicing with the hamstring injury. I do think uh, Josh Jacobs could be one of these guys that we look up and say, oh shit, scored a couple touchdowns today. Yeah, uh, interesting. I like that Raiders offense. Is it- we're going to find out, is Arizona's offense and defense completely horrible? Are the Chiefs that good? I guess we'll find out a little bit. We, I mean, I think the Chiefs are – I don't know if they're that good, but they're definitely good. They sort of stole that game a little bit last night, in my opinion. But I think the Raiders' offense uh, is definitely going to be in play 
for sure in DFS along with, with prop betting this week. Uh, let's go down to uh, what's the next one here is the pace. A little bit of pace. Yeah. So there's a couple games. I like the so the Washington Detroit game. I'm going to be talking about that uh, from a sports betting perspective in just a little bit. But it looks like that game looks pretty juicy to have a lot of plays. What else is going to be going out here in week two? Yeah, the other one that's popping is Cincy at Dallas. But, I mean, as we saw Mike McCarthy kind of throwing Kellen Moore under the bus uh, here today, saying that, you know, the Cowboys just haven't can't be that aggressive, you know, with the current group they have. And I think that really should be more so the criticism of the Cowboys offense. Not Kellen Moore, who has led the Cowboys to the fourth most points in the league since taking over in 2019. More so the reality that this team entered week one with something named Dennis Houston and Noah Brown starting at wide receiver. Like, that's the problem here. I don't think it's your play caller that has, you know, multiple years of really goodness on his resume the bad QB draw against San Francisco aside but yes in terms of slow pace spots Patriots and Steelers and Seahawks and 49ers and keep an eye on that weather in San Francisco I think we'll talk about that a little more when we get this player props but once again Brett it's saying like a quarter inch of rain or something like morning into afternoon Should just Tra- follow him around all season yeah can Trey Lance is get a dome game already but it's not going to be uh pretty out there uh we'll see if that ends up leading to a pretty run heavy game script yeah, and I like this Washington-Detroit game for sure. Both, I think, offenses underrated this year. And uh, with this pace, it looks like a lot of points could be scored in that one. Uh, let's go to pressure rate. This can be good for maybe finding a special defense, uh, special teams to use. It could also be, uh, you know, maybe able to steer away from a quarterback that maybe we might want to use. What's really standing out in terms of pressure? It's just week one, but what, what are we looking at this week, Ian? Exactly. So a bit of grain of salt here sometimes, but Geno Smith, Kyler, and Joe Flacco standing out as the guys that should be seeing the most pressure. At least Kyler should have a healthier version of Zach Ertz this week. So still no Rondale Moore, but I'm not hating the idea of going back to Ertz and uh, Marquise Brown, especially this week, more so in tournaments. You and mean Greg we, Dortch, right? Yeah, stop it. <laughs> maybe. Well, maybe, Dortch's going to be popular. Maybe, maybe, maybe this is a week where your guy AJ Green gets back on track. And then uh, with Joe Flacco against, you know, Miles Garrett and company, obviously not not the easiest matchup, but man, we saw that Browns front seven shut down McCaffrey and company last week. Panthers literally averaged negative yards before contact per carry. So even if the Jets like don't want Flacco throwing the ball 59 times again, I still think they're going to have to throw more times than not just because of that front seven. So I could see Elijah Moore really putting together a nice performance, nice bounce back spot for him. I think this week, despite some of the pressure there on Flacco in terms of the most time, Matt Ryan, if he has healthy receivers, man, though, Michael Pittman is listed as questionable. Alec Pierce already ruled out, but Matt Ryan a little bit better than I think the box score indicated last week. He had two touchdowns dropped in the end zone by Pierce and then Ashton Doolin. And then also we have Lamar Jackson set up. Well, with that said, I think that's one of the examples of the flukiness uh, with some of these one week uh, totals because last week, Mac Jones, third quickest release time in the week. And because of that, the Dolphins couldn't really get after Lamar. So it's still a situation where Lamar against the Blitz, man, even going back to week one last season, just has been, you know, riding the struggle bus there. So you can blame it more on Greg Roman. You can blame it more on him not having receivers to go get the ball. Regardless, he's been a bottom five, bottom 10 quarterback by just about any metric you want to look at against the blitz. And I do think Miami is going to continue to bring it. They have been the most blitz heavy defense in the league since last year. Finally, Marcus Mariota is looking good, man. I thought that Falcons offense actually impressed uh, versus what we should have been expecting versus Saints last week. That said, I think uh, we're going to see the Rams probably take a bit of a step forward when they're not facing Josh Allen and the juggernaut Bills. Uh, and I want to know on Michael Pittman, uh, it's he's questionable was the tag he got on Friday. Uh, but I saw either a beat writer or maybe even someone on the team said it was more of a preca- more precautionary than anything. So come Sunday, I'm expecting Pittman to be out there if you know, and if it is a, just, you know, a precautionary holdout sort of, I think is like DeAndre Swift a little bit earlier in the week. Okay. Swift got in some practice today. I expect Swift to be a full go. I'm expecting Michael Pittman to be a, a full go too, which actually might keep his ownership down a little bit in DFS. People are worried about it. So an interesting little angle there. Uh, let's scroll down to yards before contact for the running backs. What are we looking at here? Any good uh, running backs we might want to use? The offensive lines may have dominated in week one. 
Bucks, Falcons, Lions, Saints, 49ers, really the top five uh, units set up to smash at the line scrimmage. We'll see with the Leonard Fournette and really this whole Buccaneers injury report. I'm not sure if this has been more just rest planned or if they're actually banged up. But as we know, Lenny routinely has, you know, one of the largest workloads in the league. So not afraid going back there. Cordero Patterson, once again, in play with Damian Williams, ruled out with the rib injury. Tougher matchup against Aaron Donald and company. But as we know, CPAT always capable of getting his as a receiver. I'm with you on DeAndre Swift. Similar sentiment to Michael Pittman. If just the questionable tag drives down that ownership, we'll certainly take advantage of that. The same situation, man. I just think ah, it's just tough to really even get a good feel on. Obviously, Tampa Bay. I know Zeke averaged five yards per carry last week, but typically expecting them to have a stronger front seven. I'm afraid of this just kind of being a three-headed mess if Kamara is even going to be active. And then with the 49ers, Hey, Debo's going to keep getting his, man. The dude's been just about the single most efficient runner in the league over these past uh, few seasons, even regardless of position you want to look at. So Jeff Wilson should still see his too, though. Britt, I mean, my goodness, can people quit running with every damn quote we see out here? Shanahan was talking about the RB2 competition, saying, yes, Jeff Wilson is our starter. Behind Jeff Wilson, they're going to ride the hot hand. The amount of outlets I saw running with that, my goodness. You, it's, it's 2022, everyone. We can still read the full quote sometimes. I mean, what do we need more? Uh, James Winston workout videos, Derek Henry workout videos. What what gets now more pickup talking. on Twitter? Now we're talking. <laughs> uh, all right, let's get down to EPA. Uh, again, one of the games I'm going to talk about, Washington at Detroit. I know we correlated this last year to some success over the past couple of years that we've done that. When you see two teams that are positive going up against each other, uh, maybe take the over. If one team has a big mismatch, maybe look at that team in terms of the spread. What are you looking at this week? Yeah, definitely agree. I mean, just in terms of the over the Washington Detroit game and also Vikings Philly, just two instances where I think the offenses are going to be able to instill their will. Now, could Wentz and Goff do Wentz and Goff things and kind of mess that up? Always a possibility, but those are looking good. Also, Cardinals and Raiders, I think deservedly has that top, uh, you know, over under of the week still remaining. The uh, upset alert where when we look at a team that has a relative offensive advantage yet or listed as underdogs, the Steelers, Panthers, a lot of them this week, Steelers, Panthers, Dolphins, uh, commanders, Falcons, Bears, and the Vikings. So some of those lines are, are are interesting, man. Falcons, 10, 10 and a half points against the Rams. Like just based on what we saw week one, I certainly uh, don't think that there may be th- – that the spread should be that far apart on them with the Dolphins plus three and a half. Again, how they played against Lamar last year. I'm not so sure that, you know, Lamar is going to be able to just have his usual goodness against the, against the defense that caused him all those problems with the blitz when they can't run the ball right now. Maybe JK Dobbins coming back changes that, but wasn't a good showing in week one and Steelers versus uh man, the Patriots, as much as I wouldn't mind packing the Steelers because of how just terrible that Patriots offense looked last week. Like Britt, did you watch that Bengals Steelers game throughout? Like it was just incredible to wrap your mind around. Like the, the ending that- of that game was like the last overtime and you know the final ten minutes of the fourth quarter were probably the most ridiculous I've seen in a game in a long time. Just the fact that Burrow and those guys were still in that. My man, we'll get to our props in a second. But the fact that the one prop I missed was Trubisky under 20 and a half pass attempts. And we had overtime happen to get over that. I'm still tilted, man. But yes. Yes. So I think that's about it. I saw in our YouTube, if you are watching on YouTube, please click the like button. We do appreciate that. Uh, I see some chopper emojis in the YouTube. Uh, Someone's looking. Someone's looking for that. And then uh, there was a question, uh, no combined pass yards for drop back in the article this year. Ian, what happened to that? Yeah, I guess I got to get it going. I, 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 I'll, I'll say when I was putting it together, I thought that that was just, I was kind of getting the same takeaways as the explosive passing play. So I'll add it back next week. I appreciate that people uh, l- l- like They're making you work harder for the same amount of money. No, that's, that's <laughs> very fair. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll get that back out there. I appreciate you guys looking at it. All right, someone's looking at it. All right, so that's going to do it for the Mismatch Manifesto. You can look at that and everything else over at PFF if you want to get a subscription over there. Uh, one of the only tools I use outside of the stuff we have here personally at Roto Grinders uh, to make my lineups and do a lot of my sports betting. Uh, speaking of sports betting, uh, it was a reasonably bad week for me and a reasonably good week for Ian, at least on the picks we did on the show. Uh, so, Ian, I'm going to give you a pat on the back. First off, you you got me on that on the on the, the Seahawks. We, we we battled on that, and it was a decisive victory in your end. Uh, congratulations! As the week grew on, 
Uh, I was starting to get a lot of trends on the Seahawks to win that game. Should have listened to you. So I lost a couple of bucks on that one. But uh, congrats for for beating me head to head and our major disagreement. About damn time. I think you probably got three or four straight on me to start last year when we had these. So I'll, I'll take it for now, Britt. Did we'll, you see uh, all those fumbles at the one yard line though? Where, <laughs> the, uh, no, hey, a win's a win's a win. We're gonna we're gonna give it to you on that one. King Gino, uh, man, King Gino. Yeah, I like uh, Gino. I, it's not enough a play for this show, but Gino rush yards. Uh, I think I like. Quite, quite, it's like nine and a half or something. Uh, Quarter, I mean, quarterback rushing props are a hell of a drug to bet the over. Yeah, it's fun. I, I like them. Uh, all right, so I'll let you lead off. Pick your favorite. Let's talk. Uh, you know, spreads or over unders first. Uh, you beat me last week. I'll let you start off. What do you like this week? One on one last week on the uh, game bets, you know, had that Bengals loss to the Steelers. As I think we all could see what I was thinking there, and we did get the Ravens beating the Jets, but took that out and then did get Seahawks plus six and a half. How about them apples? The three spreads I like this week: Eagles two and a half at home on Monday Night Football against Kirk Cousins. We've all seen the Kirk Cousins prime time statistics before, but more than anything, like kind of lost in that week one was Cousins really getting pressured uh, big time throughout that entire game, and no, the Eagles weren't able to really slow down golf and company as much as you might have liked to see. But Detroit Lions did have PFF's number three offensive line going to the season. And they have done a pretty good job fortifying that offense everywhere, kind of except under center. So I still think the Eagles defense could be pretty damn good. And they're going to have Darius Slay and James Bradbury to go up against Jefferson and Thielen. You know, Packers defensive strategy, we don't need to get into that again. But I just think the Eagles on both sides of the ball are a lot better than, not maybe not a lot better, but I think they're a better team than the Vikings. And, you know, shout out to uh, Trevor Sikama at PFF. Has the Eagles as a top five team, uh, I believe, in his power. Power ranking. So I'm just uh, taking the points at only two and a half at home against a Vikings team that I just don't think is quite as good. Also like the Broncos minus 10 at home versus Houston. Again, credit to Houston for making that, you know, an overtime tie or yeah, because freaking Lovey Smith isn't interested in winning games. I guess punting at midfield on fourth and three. Come on, man. Hey, but, it ties a win when you're the underdog. Get out of here. So <laughs> he, but, you know, in that game, again, I didn't think it even should have been that close. Alec Pierce dropped a touchdown. Alex, Ashton Doolin dropped him, had it like nine knocked out so to me that was the, the instance of the Colts having a bad game and so just clearly being the superior team still haven't seen enough from that Houston defense Derek Stingley awesome you know rookie coming up and stuff at corner but not convinced that they're gonna be able to slow down Russell Wilson and company you know now no longer having this emotional road spot in Seattle back home I think we see the Broncos kind of flex their muscles here a little bit blow out the Texans and finally Falcons plus 10 on the road versus the Rams you know I would say this is my confident level the the, the least confidence one uh that I got going on here but with that said just what we saw week one the Stafford I'm not convinced that uh to your point earlier Britt I'm not convinced Stafford's fully healthy right now and he can play to his best ability and this could just be a tough matchup you know Cooper Cup's gonna get his I'm sure but if AJ Terrell can take out Allen Robinson I mean we saw last week the Rams couldn't really run the ball they had no one else really getting open for them. Tyler Higby's out there getting double-digit targets at this point in time. So if Mariota, CPAT, London, Kyle Pitts, this – Falcons offense that low key has a, a, quite a few places to go with the ball. I just think they can keep it, you know, with, with within one score, maybe eight or nine points as opposed to ten. All right, I'm actually I'm, I'm on board with all of these. I don't. I did bet the Eagles. I I got the over in that game at 48 on the nice. look ahead lines. Uh, I'll talk about that in just a second uh, because I think that's an important thing I want to stress. I got to look ahead line for you for next week too, by the oh, way. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I think it's up to 52, but I like the Eagles, um, the Bronco, you know, a team traveling to Houston in the first or into Denver in the first couple of weeks. Uh, there's a lot of trends with with that, so I do like your Broncos one. And I, I don't I don't know if I'd put I have I haven't bet the Falcons, but I under you know a 10 point spread with maybe your quarterback having a wonky elbow and the only actual guy that's good is Cooper Cup on your entire offense. I mean, Cooper Cup's going to get his 15 targets, but other than that, if they can keep him out of the end zone a couple of times, uh, I think that is a pretty interesting one. I think Cordell, uh, Corderell Patterson, mm -hmm. uh, your dude, I mean, he's going to, he's going to be very interesting this week because he should have a, the entire backfield to himself along with some receiving work. So I think he's a little bit of a sneaky play in DFS. Uh, a couple of bets I got in terms of spread and over unders. I got the Steelers plus two. I, I know it's Mitch Trubisky, but I mean, no team deserves to be an underdog at home. Maybe if it was, I don't know, what's what's the worst team in in the NFL right now? Uh, like, not the Bears. I'll tell you what, not the Bears. I don't know. I don't know if there is a defined worst team in the NFL right now, but I don't think any team deserves to be a, a home underdog to this Patriots quotation mark offense, right? I mean, it's it looked like a total mess. We were getting all that vibe preseason. 
it came to fruition. They're, the Steelers, they, they have actual offensive skill position players outside of Mitchell Trubisky. They have actual good players on defense. You look at what Fitzpatrick was able to do last week. I think the Steelers plus two, I'm going to take that one, and I'm just going to ride with it. I think that's a live dog, too, if you want to take the, the money line. I think it's like plus 110, not a huge, huge or anything like that. But if you want to get some plus money on an underdog, I think they're in play. Also, Tomlin in his career, 14-3-2 against the spread as a home dog. So you got the Tomlin narrative uh, looking pretty good as well against the Patriots. And the other one, that Washington-Detroit over 48 should have bet this on the look ahead line, um, but it took it took me a couple of days to realize that these offenses are look pretty good. They're they're very underrated, and both defenses I don't think are very good are very good right now. The Lions' defense is not going to be very good, and Washington until they get Chase Young back, I don't think is is very good. They were down towards the end of that game against Jacksonville. It's forty eight. It's in a dome. It's perfect conditions. That Washington skill set, right? If you add it all up, Antonio Gibson, McLaurin, you've got. Uh, Curtis Samuel, you've got Dotson, you've got uh, Logan Thomas, like you got McKissick on third down. Like it's a pretty, like that's got to be like a top 10 overall skill position set, I think in the NFL. I might've mentioned this last week. So Wentz has some weapons and you look at Swift, St. Brown, Hawkinson, you got Shark out there able to actually stretch the field. Not that Goff's ever going to throw it to him that deep, but I think these offenses are very underrated. Give me the over 48 in that game. Uh, those are really good ones. And the look ahead line, I like. So I got the earlier, late last week, I got the Bills minus seven against the Titans. And that's up to what, 10 or nine and a half or something like that. And they're going into Miami next week and it's at four and a half. And like if the, if the Bills come out and trounce the Titans, which I don't know, call, I think the Bills are clearly the best team. I think by a pretty wide margin from the week one showing. Yeah. This is going to be a touchdown. And, and especially if Miami doesn't win this game and they're an underdog, I think Miami is a live underdog because I think that Ravens secondary is very banged up. And we saw Dolphins want to throw the ball as they should once you have Tyree Kill and Jalen Waddell. But if Miami loses that game and the Bills crush, I mean, this is going to be a touchdown going into Miami next week. So if you're looking on the look ahead line, four and a half Buffalo, I'm looking to for that. Even if the Bills play close and Miami – just squeaks out a victory. I don't think it moves, but I think it could really jettison upwards towards seven very quickly. So um, that's something I always like to do on the sports books, get a couple a week ahead. Uh, so take a look at the bills minus four and a half. I'm not going to count that one on our record because I'll forget about it by the time like three weeks go by or whatever. <laughs> um, but, that, but, but that is a fun one if you're looking uh, a, a week ahead. Uh, let's jump into player props. And you have an interesting one here. As soon as I saw you, we were talking a little bit uh, earlier when we were getting ready for the show, you posted one and I immediately was like, that's the line. I, I, I saw you typing it up and I immediately went to bet it. So why don't you talk about that one? Cause I already have real life dollars on this one. I think this is one of the, the top ones of the week right now. Coming back, nice little two and one start last week. We got Trey Lance over eight and a half rush attempts, plus 105 over at DraftKings. Absolutely, man, because we've now seen four extended appearances. This is including even one of his, the game where he came in at halftime and he still had like 13 rush attempts or something ridiculous, but he's averaging 11 rush attempts per game. I mean, his 17 game pace is going to put him up there with Lamar Jackson and basically nobody else. So talk before about the potential for there to be a lot of rain, rain in San Francisco. And if that's the case, man, you lost Elijah Mitchell. It's more reason than ever to keep using Trey Lance. And just, I think we could honestly get close to this with the design stuff. And then we just have the opportunity for him to scramble all over the place like he was doing last week. So I think regardless of game script, giving some of the weather at hand and just giving the absence of Mitchell, we're going to see Trey Lance with a great opportunity to smash this over here. Also love Elijah Mitchell to score a touchdown plus 300 over at FanDuel. Elijah hey. Moore. More, not Elijah Mitchell. There we go. Uh, we've actually seen more now play three games with Joe Flacco. Flacco came in for Mike White at the end of a game last year. He threw three passes, two of them to Moore, 40 yards, touchdown. The next week, Moore goes for 141 yards and a touchdown with Flacco under center. Last week wasn't great. Five catches, I think like 47 yards. Did have a touchdown, got nullified by a rightful offensive pass interference call. But the point is, man, like really, one just ref decided not to throw a flag away from having three touchdowns and just over two. 
two games with Joe Flacco back under center this week. Yeah, the Browns are they have a good defense, but Denzel Ward doesn't shadow. We saw Robbie Anderson get behind this group last week. I think there's gonna be more than enough opportunities for Elijah Moore to go get into the end zone at plus 300 odds. And finally, I do like James Conner to score a touchdown plus 104. He can get that over at Caesar Sportsbook. 20 touchdowns in 17 games with the Cardinals. And I think a big reason why Britt is the Cardinals refuse to use Kyle Murray on QB sneaks, just one in his entire career. And now biggest shootout of the week, Cardinals Raiders. Again, the, the highest game total we have left at this point. Connor's the primary touchdown scorer in this game. So if I can get anything close to plus odds, like we have here, I'll easily take that. So yeah, Kyler Murray, just one career QB sneak. And because of that Cardinals running backs have been top five in goal line carries since 2019. So James Connor scored a touchdown. Elijah Moore scored a touchdown and Trey Lance over eight and a half rush attempts. Yeah, I like Connor, too, because he he was basically the only back on the field for the first half of that game. And then as it got completely out of hand, they played a couple other guys. But if this game's close, I don't know. I don't know. I sort of like the Raiders. Uh, but if it's close, I expect Connor to almost have, you know, what, an 80 percent, 90 percent snap share as a true three down workhorse. Yep. Uh, and, and what do we count? Right. So we basically keep like little records two and one. How we do on props. What does a plus 300 get you? Does that get you give, get you three or does that get you two? Does that get you? I'm one? just, we'll just, I'm just all in. Went All right, lot. yeah, that's a that's a nice one. A couple I got. Uh, so I I just I just can't believe some of the the kicker props that these sites throw out. Here. That they don't make any sense. So I, I I like this. I like rushing yards from quarterbacks. I like kicker props. I do oh a lot of the kicker props on Prize Picks. Um, but the, the, so just listen, listen to this. This this dude's hit this in eleven of his last twelve games. He's in a dome for a favorite against a team's that offense is going to struggle. And defense is just good enough to get stops. And the team has no qualms whatsoever of running him out there for 50, 60 yard field goals, whatever you want. Now he's got a backup long snapper this week. So I'm giving it away. Oh Evan McPherson over one and a half field goals is base. It's minus 105 on DraftKings. He's hit it in 11 of 12, Ian. I, I don't understand this. You got you got a family, Brett, and you're grinding this kicker analysis. Listen, right I love I love on. the kicker props. Me and Chief, we do the shows on Tuesday, and we love the kicker props. Uh, they come out early on on the the prop site. It's it's less egregious than talking kickers for fantasy. I'll give you that. Yeah, so I like uh, I love that minus 105. Uh, I like Sutton. He on MGM he, over 54 and a half was minus 115. I'm going the over. Uh, he had the six most air yards week one. Uh, 40% air yard share of his own team and a, like a Russell Wilson bomb. It's one of those and it's an over and Wilson likes to throw deep. He's getting the air yards on the team. That looks like a pretty juicy prop. And I'm also taking another air yards master from week one is Brandon cooks. He's at 62 and a half dude at 12 targets. He's the only, only actual NFL starting caliber pass catcher, maybe even on, on like the entire team run it. Like the only, caliber skill position player that could make another NFL roster. Maybe Pierce could probably too, but at 62 and a half, he's the only one. And if you like the Broncos to, to win by 10, those fourth quarter yards, Ian, they count. Uh, so I like Brandon cooks over 62 and a half on MGM or DraftKings. I think was minus minus one ten or minus one fifteen. Uh, go get those. You mentioned um, these won't be official, but you, you like Elijah Moore. Uh, guess what the receiving targets for, the backfield from the Jets, uh, Michael Carter and like, Brees so Hall. Well, was 17 or 18 last week? It was from wild. check down Flacco. They were both at, they're both at two and a half receptions this weekend. Yeah. I, I, hit, the, I hit the over on both already, but. Yeah. And again, I like the Jets were the second most pass happy team in the league in week one, even taking away the garbage time snaps. They're only behind the Raiders, I believe. So I don't think they're going to want to do that every single week. Like we got to be careful. I remember last year in week one, you know, DeAndre Swift and Jamal Williams both just went nuts getting a shit ton of targets in a similar sort of game script. With that said, I, I guess that would be my biggest concern, man. Like, I'm not sure Jacoby Brissett's going to jump on these guys the same way like Lamar was able to do in the first 45 minutes. But two and a half seems uh, pretty low. If it was four and a half, I'd be, you know, having more qualms there. Yeah, I, I like I like the, all those Jets little dump offs from check down Flacco this week. Uh, but if you guys want to check out any of the the lines, whether it's props or spreads or anything like that, you can check it out over on Scores and Odds. Uh, we have all of that. That is all available for free, by the way. And then if you want to get access to the picks, I know our NFL team, I believe they were up 12 units on week one uh, as a whole collective. So you can go check that out if you want to subscribe and get picks uh, from all the guys here at Roto-Grinders. And you can go get that over at Scores and Odds. 
Uh, all right, let's jump into position by position for some NFL DFS as we wrap up the show. Uh, let's talk quarterback. Ian, it's a pretty, you know, I want to play Jalen Hurts. I want to play Josh Allen. I want to play Patrick Mahomes, and I want to play Justin Herbert. And I don't have any of these guys on the main slate this week. So I don't know if we're calling it dumpster diving. So up at the top, we've got guys like Lamar Jackson, who didn't really run a lot week one. And one, I don't, he didn't need to. And then two, does Lamar Jackson want to run until he gets paid? Is this going to be like, I guess we'll find out a little bit in this game. Cause if they're going to unleash him, they're, I think they're going to need to a little bit in this game here, but the Miami defense, you mentioned the stuff against the blitz. I don't think we're really paying up for that. Kyler Murray, no way in hell with Greg Dorch as wide receiver one. Am I paying for Kyler Murray? So we're sort of going down in price a little bit. A couple of guys that look pretty good to me. Uh, our car, right? Car had 295 yards. If he got five more, he gets that 300 bonus on DraftKings. I'm expecting him to have a pretty nice game along with the Raiders offense as a whole. Uh, you've got Trey Lance who's sitting there. You've got that rush prop. If we have a guy who's going to, what did he have, 13 rushing attempts in week one? If he's going to do something like that again, and he's got less of a running back situation this week, and I know the passing might not be great, but you just touch, you just add on 150 yards and a passing touchdown to 13 or 14 rush attempts, and you've got yourself a quarterback one for sure. This is sort of where I'm at least leaning from the cash game perspective. Yep. I'm also with Trey Lance. I just think 5,700, like just, he has the, he shouldn't be, he shouldn't be this much cheaper than got than pocket passers, you know, that are going 500 plus ahead of him on the pricing scale. So Kyler against Max Crosby and that D line, that offense didn't look good. He just doesn't have enough weapons. He, he still got his way over 20 fantasy points, but I, I would kind of rather spend up at some of these wide receiver spots and same, you know, sentiment with Lamar Jackson where, okay, maybe you do have to worry a little bit about the rush attempts. I'm not so much worried about that more. So again, just that, blitz happy dolphins defense that gave him a lot of problems last year and i do think they are built to continue to do that Xavier howard is going to be locking up or shot bateman i think for most of the afternoon and i it just could be a rough afternoon for lamar jackson out there against what we saw again in week one a very very good dolphins defense even though they couldn't get a ton of pressure then so that's for cash going with trey lance two i like though actually in gpps matt ryan 5.5k against the jaguars especially sounding like michael Pittman's going to be out there now we have a little chance to actually get matt ryan and multiple receivers uh and not have to worry about the rotation as much last week pierce was rotating with ashton doolin so you could throw doolin out there i prefer prefer paris campbell but matt ryan michael Pittman, paris campbell you know maybe jonathan taylor takes all the yards for himself but we did see ryan get those pass attempts quite high uh last week i know the game script kind of made it that so but with, there was already chatter before the season about the colts not necessarily being this offense that wants jonathan taylor to lead the league in rush attempts uh, i do think matt ryan against the jaguars secondary that we saw make pa uh, carson wentz look godlike last week uh could be a nice little gpp play just 5.5k so allows you to really spend up elsewhere and also davis mills i mean look we we saw it last year. He had multiple, I think three or four, I think three games where he cleared over 300 yards. Uh, it might've even tallied three touchdowns on top of that. So probably be garbage time against the Broncos, but Davis Mills at 5,200 easiest stacking partner we have out there with Brandon cooks. And then he can bring it back with the Cortland Sutton. I'm, you know, it's, I'm not going to have a, a ton of exposure to it, but I'll have at least a couple lineups out there with uh, that Davis Mills cook stack. We saw a couple of the booms and I think the Broncos defense is good. We saw, you know, Randy Gregory, Bradley Chubb. That's a great uh, one, two punch at the line of scrimmage with that said, man, Gino Smith looked pretty, pretty damn good in week one. And, you know, it's like, okay, was Gino that good? Maybe this Broncos defense isn't quite uh, playing at its highest level just yet. The Seahawks know they can trade Gino Smith for some draft picks. They, they, get, <laughs> they got they got to get on that before uh, before Gino Smith maybe uh, turn, you know, turns it down just a little bit. But uh, I, I like Wentz, right? I mentioned the over-under uh, 48 taking the over in that Washington game. Why not take Wentz in perfect conditions in a dome? With a whole bunch of weapons, you know, you'll probably waste a couple of lineups trying to figure out who to get the ball to. You got Curtis Samuel getting all the low A dot targets. Uh, you know, I think Terry McLaurin will eventually emerge as the alpha. I think he's due for a little bit of a bounce back. And uh, you've got the rookie Dotson. I think he's interesting too. He's probably not going to catch two touchdowns every game, um, but I like him. You can stack him up with McLaurin or Gibson, and you could run that back with a Swift or a, or a St. Brown and look pretty good in a tournament, in my opinion. So that's where I'm coming coming at from the tournament perspective. Uh, on Let's go to running back. Uh, we'll start with cash games. 
All right, so let's talk Saquon first here, Ian. So he had the massive game week one. Looks like he's back. DraftKings didn't price him up enough. FanDuel did. Uh, I don't know. I think I'm playing him on DraftKings. FanDuel, it's a little bit tougher. You can just reach up to get Jonathan Taylor and I think have a little bit more of an absolute sure thing. But if Saquon is going to be, you know, the three down back, go bananas in the passing game, get, you know, 15 to 20 rush attempts every game and the dude's back, this looks like a pretty nice spot for him. So I'm eyeing him. I'm looking at, uh, well, well, let's talk about him first. And then we'll talk about a couple of the other ancillary pieces. Look, I mean, he has the same sort of workload right now as Taylor and McCaffrey, and he's just, you know, 2,600 cheaper uh, than Taylor at this point. So, yeah, not nearly priced up enough. He's going up against a Panthers defense. At home, we saw the Panthers get shredded by both Nick Chubb and Kareem Hunt last week. Saquon has – he played the most high snap rate of any running back in the NFL last week. He looked great. Saquon is back. Need to have him and, you know, in my opinion, every DraftKings cash lineup. Also have Daryl Henderson, only 5.7K, big home favorite. Those are the top two running backs in snap rates last week. Number one, Saquon. Number two, Daryl Henderson. And no running back actually ran a route on a higher percentage of their team's dropbacks than Daryl Henderson. So I think Akers will get a little more involved. But, man, Henderson's the dude. And you mentioned before how Cliff Kingsbury and the Cardinals like to hand their starting running backs, you know, these big workloads. Similar sentiment with Sean McVay and the Rams. So that guy's Henderson and 5.7 K to be a 10 point favorite at home versus Falcons. You if it ends up being like a 60, 40 proposition as early as next week, which I think is unlikely still has a chance to meet that value. I like chase Edmonds at 5.2 K that's just really cheap. And his role was like what we're kind of, what we thought chase what we thought Austin Eckler was going to be having this year and more so what he had last year. And Eckler still been getting his 20 plus touches uh, per game too, but chase Edmonds at 5.2 K against a Ravens defense that could be, you know, hurting pretty bad at, corner uh, i don't hate the thought there of the dolphins falling behind feeding Edmonds some of those eckler s garbage time carries finally i did like javante at 6.5k potentially like just when i was building out my cash lineup that was uh the amount i had left uh, at one point in time so 6.5k big home favorite against the texans again just from that perspective it's fine but what we saw last week in terms of his upside as a as a pass catcher uh it, c- it could be pretty great so Devonte, man if we can get that 15 carries five targets a game in a high scoring offense we don't even need the full-time role melvin gordon could get, get his too uh if you had to pick a, another maybe i guess big time running back uh, i'm gonna throw a couple guys at you tell me who you prefer you got Len- leonard Fournette, joe mixon deandre swift Antonio Gibson. I got all of those guys in the cash consideration. Do you well, have a James Connor? Well, yeah, throw, yeah. throw Con- uh, I don't know if I trust Arizona. I, I, I gotta see it. I gotta see it from that Arizona offense. They're just they're too depleted. Yeah. I hear you. I want I'm uh, we'll see what Fournette's final injury designation is. Antonio Gibson, I like a lot. I have him as one of my GPP uh players. And honestly, Joe Mixon uh shouldn't be out of the equation as well. I mean, Bengals seven point favorites against that Dallas defense that we know Parsons is gonna make some plays, but you know, Leonard Fournette certainly looked fine running through that front seven more times than not last week. And the good news with Joe Mixon, even if they're still taking him off the field on third downs for Samaj Piran, they did have him playing over Piran in two minute situations. So that's how Mixon got up to seven receptions last week. I do think his workload this year could actually be a little bit more fantasy friendly than it even was last year uh and i want to note too this is a DraftKings tournament play only because on fanduel uh this guy is going to be relatively high on and this might be a cock up, cop out um but jonathan taylor is going to be sub 10 percent owned on on draft kings this week just because this mid-tier looks pretty strong i, I don't know spend spending up for jonathan taylor is contrarian this week I, am i copping out I think he said something else the first time. I'm not going to call it. I told <laughs> myself after just a second. <laughs> oh, man. No, I think, I think that's fine. Him and McCaffrey, honestly, man. Like, I don't – Saquon is probably going to be like the chalk of the entire slate. If I had to guess like the single highest owned player on DraftKings. So anytime that you have a Taylor or McCaffrey, that's not just dominating the ownership coverage. I certainly think it's okay to get a share. Same principle as like Derrick Henry, you know, when it's, when people say it's not Derrick Henry week, you know, we try to buy into that. So uh, it was, you know, Britt, we said last week, like probably the move to be contrarian was paying up at wide receiver. <sighs> What do you think it is this week? Is it more of like a middle approach or what, what, what do you think is like the best way just to go across the grain and just normal lineup construction? For, from the receiver 
spot just, or just in general? Do you think we should be paying up at running back and get to McCaffrey and Taylor now that people kind of seem to be off them? Because maybe this week after seeing Adams and these guys go nuts, maybe the high end wide receivers are fetching it. And now we want to go back against the grain a little bit. Pay I up just think there's back. so many good plays across the board at both running back and wider tight ends, the, the really weak spot this week. Yeah. But there's just so many ways you can make a lineup, I think. But with you can spend there's five thousand, six thousand dollar wide receivers. You don't need the Devontae Adams or the Cooper yeah. Cups this week because you've got the St. Browns, you've got the Pittmans, you've got the Brandon Cooks, the Christian Kirks, right? You've got all these guys that are just a little bit cheaper, and you can get all of these guys in and have like a nice balance lineup. You can get some stars and scrubsies if you want to roll out Greg Dorch, right? You can pay up at one of the running back spots or get a Cooper cup or Devonte Adams. I think there's, I don't even know if you, from a lineup construction technique, you really even have to think about it because there's just so many available options. Bo show. All right. Last running back. I want to talk about before we get to wide receiver though, Josh Jacobs, again, popping in the mismatch manifesto stuff, 5.8 K in a shootout. And I just think that again, if Brandon Bolton is out, we could actually see Jacobs starting to catch the ball a little bit more often than we're used to. So moving on to, to wide receiver, it is tough to get Devonte get off Devonte Adams and cash, man. Like just the potential for him. I think I saw his reception over hundreds at like seven and a half this week. And you know, I, if I had to bet that I'd probably be taking the over here Cardinals defense. I don't think it's going to have any answer to him. They couldn't guard anybody out there in Kansas City uh, last week. Already seeing Derek Carr just zeroing in on Adams, seemingly play-by-play -play basis. I think there is enough value elsewhere to pay up for Devontae Adams. Behind him, Amon Ross St. Brown. Like, yeah, I was saying it on the PFF Fantasy Pod. Like, how many weeks does the Sun God need to be a wide receiver one before we're just like, okay, he's a wide receiver one. He's not being priced that way necessarily. So still just 65 k uh, or 6500 you know, out there against a the Washington defense that I just don't think again is going to be having much answers for him in the slot. It was the same, you know, strategy we used last week, you know, betting his over on the receptions and then just really loading up on him in cash games and tournaments alike, man. When he has this, this easy low A dot slot role, it's really tough for him not to be catching more than six passes pretty much on a weekly basis. And finally, I just, man, Elijah Moore at 5K, man. Someone that talented that we could easily see get double digit targets and not even blink an eye. I cannot believe Elijah Moore is only like 100 more than Sterling Shepard. The receivers that he's grouped in with is just so wrong. So, Elijah Moore for me, cash tournaments. I want uh, all the Elijah Moore this week. Yeah, I think you can even, if you can't reach up to Devontae Adams, I mean, you can just like St. Brown and Michael Pittman as your wide receiver one and two. And like, I think Pittman's going to be healthy for this game. And I think Pittman, he was definitely underpriced week one. I think he's still underpriced with the true alpha role. And now they're down uh, the rookie out there in Indianapolis. I mean, I think Pittman is in store for a really good game. Uh, Christian Kirk is still a little bit too cheap. He's, he's getting all the targets week in the preseason. He got all the targets in week one. He's going to get all the targets all season. They, they paid these guys, what I mentioned at the top of the show. They pay them. They use them. We, we're finally seeing teams. Be reasonably smart. Now I know the Cowboys paid Zeke and they continue to use them, but I don't I don't know if they needed to do that. The teams needed to pay for these wide receivers to get them and they're using them. So I think Christian Kirk is another one if you can't find any room to spend up to the top there. Uh my GPP play is going to be Debo Samuel. Uh, I know you like Trey Lance, but this is just going to be he's back. He's going to get what six, seven carries seven or eight targets. He's going to be a red zone threat. If it's not Trey Lance running it, Jeff Wilson, we've played the Jeff Wilson game a bunch of times and he's not very good. He can get there, but I think they much prefer to have the ball in Trey Lance's hands and in Debo Samuel hands. He's coming in at under 10%, I believe on both sites because everybody's just going to pay a little bit more for Devontae Adams. And I think rightfully so, but in a tournament, anything can happen. Ian, if, if Debo has two touchdowns and 75 yards receiving and 50 yards on the ground, that's not going to surprise anybody this week. Hey, King State Kings, obviously, you know, Shannon's going to enable Debo. It is better for him to still be more wide receiver than this running back stuff. But he, if he's going to keep averaging like six yards per carry and just being an absolute monster on the ground, which I guess he is. Uh, so, yeah, all fine with Debo. And don't keep in mind with the Seahawks defense, too. Like they already came into this year without Bobby Wagner, who went to the Rams. And now they lose Jamal Adams as well. And I know Jamal Adams is a lot of times people are making fun of him, but that's because of his coverage. That dude is a menace uh, against the run. So when you all of a sudden, 
didn't lose basically your two best run defenders from last season. Like this could be one of those games where San Francisco just runs for, you know, 300 yards and looks like they're never going to throw the ball again, which in this case this year would be good for Trey Lance and Debo Samuel. A couple of GPP wide receivers, just the, the whole 6K range, man. Like, yeah, really don't feel the okay. need uh, to pay off. I mean, Brandon Cooks talked about him a little bit before with Davis Mills, Cortland Sutton, your guy before uh, betting the over on the, on the receiving yards. I like that call. And even Hollywood Brown, someone that still scored last week, but was just surprisingly only had six targets, but all the reasons why we were lining up to play him last week still apply. And now they're facing a Raiders secondary that I don't even think is good as what the chiefs are bringing out there. So again, don't really think there's gonna be one super chalky wide receiver. If it is Allen Robinson, good. I don't want to deal with it this week. Show me that they're going to throw him the ball. And then maybe not against someone like AJ Terrell, who I think he's going to be running the majority of his routes against. Sounds like T Higgins is going to play. If not, Tyler Boyd would be more interesting. Uh, and then Julio with or without Mike Evans, I think, could be in play. But we got to check his uh, injury status, too. I'm just not sure in Tampa Bay if these guys are actually banged up or just getting a little bit of veteran rest. But Julio out there, man, with no Chris Godwin, it's going to be tough to not treat him as a top 25, 24 wide receiver in fantasy. Yeah, in terms of ownership, I'm just looking through our lineup HQ, and it is Friday. But, I mean, I think things are pretty set for the most part. We don't have a, normally receivers get – you know, the high, I think Pittman got up to like 22 or 23, at least in projected ownership. I, I don't recall what his actual was. Normally there's guys in the 20, sometimes even 30. The highest we have right now is Devonte Adams at 14 and a half percent. So it's very, very spread out. And I guess that's what I was talking about just a few minutes ago, where in terms of lineup construction at the wide, from the, from the wide receiver position, it, I don't know. I don't know if ownership really matters this week because there's just no one there's not two guys each drawing over 20 percent, and you probably shouldn't pair those guys together in your lineups and all that sort of thing in the large field tournaments i think you can just do whatever you want in in terms of the wide receiver position this week um at, at least in tournaments uh let's go to tight end and it's sort of a graveyard this week you have mark andrews who had a fine week right he's going up against miami you know i think he looks pretty good but you know he's 6400 I don't know if I if I if I want to play a good wide if I want to play Devontae Adams and Saquon Barkley and Joe Mixon and I want to play a good quarterback and I you know I want to have a couple good receivers I don't I don't have sixty four hundred for Mark Andrews so you maybe you got to go down the the list just a little bit here and we see guys like Albert O from Denver popping at least on the ownership uh, I think he had six targets in in week one. He looks reasonably good. You got Tyler Higby. I'm a little worried for Higby because a lot of those targets were late game. So I, I don't know if they're all going to come in, but he's 4,200. Darren Waller's probably like my favorite overall. You factor everything together at 5,600. I know Devontae Adams had, what was it, 17 targets week one. Uh, is that always going to, I mean, that would be an NFL record and it could happen, but I think Dar Darren Waller is good enough. And especially against Arizona, we saw Travis Kelsey go nuts. I like Darren Waller at that overall spot of 5,600. I'm not opposed to going completely. If you want to play Devontae Adams, have another good wide receiver, two good running backs. We've got Jawan Johnson at 2,500 yeah. from the Saints, and he played a ton of snaps. Just punt it because you don't have, you're not losing that Travis Kelsey can have a huge game and you're done, like happened last week when he was cheap, right? We don't have that this week. And sure, Andrews. I don't know if Pitt's ever going to have a good week. We'll, we'll see if that, that that ever happens. But just going all the way down to Johnson makes the rest of your lineups look look amazing. I'm not opposed to that this week, but I think where I'd sit overall right now would be Alberto, Johnson probably, and then if you twist my arm, Waller at 5,600 is probably like the best overall price for that one. Kyle Pitts slander aside, I think uh, <laughs> I, I think a lot of good points there, especially with the Jawan Johnson at 2.5. I mean, that's going to be my move in cash for sure on DraftKings. 10 tight ends ran a route on at least 70% of their team's week one dropbacks and got targeted on at least 50% of those routes. Eight were usual suspects. Kelsey Schultz, Higby, Hawkinson, Fryermuth, Andrews, Pitts, and Waller. The two that weren't, though, Jawan Johnson and Albert O. Again, it was hysterical watching Denver come out. Andrew Beck and Eric Saubert were just like eating early on, like Albert O 
truth is running shambles. But by the end of the game, his like his usage actually ended up being pretty damn good. He got tackled at like the half yard line, almost scored a touchdown. So Jawan Johnson, Albert O, if you want to save a little money, I think make a lot of sense. And yeah, GPP, I think uh, you know, the Pitts and Andrew calls could be good because you know, if Andrews does 6.4K, I wouldn't be surprised if you know that's easily in the seven Ks after he has one of these big weeks that we know he's always capable of. Other only other guy I mentioned is uh, Hayden Hurst at 3.6K against the Cowboys. Like, I just think that, you know, he w- did it was out there having, you know, a really high route participation rate with Joe Burrow last week. He's basically got that CJ Uzoma role from last year. And I know it's not going to exactly be hitting every single week. I probably wouldn't go to Hurst in cash because it can be a bit of a boomer bust proposition especially though, if T Higgins winds up not playing, which again, looks like he is going to be in there though. That's when guys like Hayden Hurst and Tyler Boyd become that much more alluring. All right. We got, got to get out of here. Uh, this has been the week two pro football focus fantasy show. Uh, thanks to all of you for watching, listening, however you consume it. It is much appreciated. And if you watch this on YouTube again, please click, click the like button. Uh, go check out scores and odds, our sports betting app here at Rotor grinders. Other than that, Ian, it's been a blast. I will see you same time, same place next week. Uh, Thanks, everybody, for watching. He's Ian. I'm Britt, and we out you.